Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first video lecture. Uh, we're going to be finishing off our introduction to philosophy course this way. So I hope the, the audio and visual quality on these videos is, is acceptable. If you've got any problems with them, please feel free to contact me. Uh, I'm open to any suggestions you might have. One thing I'll ask your forgiveness for in advance is that I don't really have access to good video editing software. So uh, I've got the capacity to make videos, but like the lectures, they're in some sense going to be done in, in real time, warts and all. So if I make a mistake or say something goofy or you know something stupid happens, as you've probably gotten used to by now dealing with me, uh, it's just gonna have to stay in the video. Uh, otherwise, I'm just gonna have to redo the whole thing, which might mean if I've got a video that's 30 or 40 or 50 minutes long, to redo it, I have to redo the whole video. So uh, I'm just gonna keep these things in there. Hopefully it'll give you something to at least laugh at. Um, now, I'm not gonna get any feedback if I'm trying to make jokes, so it's going to be even more awkward if I, if, uh, I try to intentionally be funny. So um, not that being that awkward has ever stopped me from doing many things before. Uh, see, this is awkward. So we're off to a pretty good start. I, I don't think you're gonna notice much of a difference in how you have to put up with me and my bizarre sense of humor. So I'm, I'm making this video here. Um, I'm posting all of the slides that are, I'm, I'm going to be going through on here. So don't worry about trying to write down notes too quickly. I'd say focus on the verbal elaboration. I'm putting the slides up on Moodle. I'll try to put up the audio files as well. And then I'll post the videos to this YouTube channel that I've got. Uh, there might also be some times where I pause the video and, and that has cut up a little bit just because I paused it and had to change a setting or taking a quick break or something and come back. So apologies if there's any weird skipping. Uh, there shouldn't be any part of the video or any of the videos that something is actually lost in. So if you do feel like you missed something, feel free to just send me an email and say, oh, you know what, at this timestamp in the video, there was a weird hiccup. Uh, if you're really concerned, you think you missed something because of it, it doesn't seem like there's continuity. And I'll, by all means, I'll, I'll take a look. So if you encounter any challenges with anything we're doing, please feel free to contact me and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you may have. So with that, we'll just get back to, uh, we had been looking at Campbell before, so we're just gonna pick up with Campbell and then we're going to move on into air after that. Uh, I've also decided to back up a little bit with Campbell. Um, and actually now that I'm, I'm seeing this, I'm gonna beg your forgiveness for just a moment anyways, because I'm going to go ahead and just uh, change what these slides look like, uh, at least for a second. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and change what the size of it is. So I'm actually gonna pause the video here, uh, so I'll be right back. Okay, and I'm back. Not that you noticed any difference. So here we go with weird Carl antics and all. All right, so let's go back to the, the slide, um, slides that we had already looked at on Campbell. So I'm gonna back up a little bit. So what we did previously when we were looking at Campbell, we started by just sort of looking at how he set up the problem. And for him, it's really this question of, and you know what, I'm just gonna back way up in these slides. Uh, given that I'm gonna post them anyways, I might as well just back up, uh, walk through what we did just a little bit here. It's, it's gonna be a little quick until we get up to where we left off. So we have been looking at this. Really, what's, what's the problem? What's, what's going on? Campbell says, really what we're trying to figure out here is whether or not somebody could have acted otherwise because they chose to act otherwise, right? And this, this is that quote at the bottom. It's this categorical proposition, exceptionless proposition, that X, whoever X is, could be me, could be you, could be anyone, they, X could have acted otherwise because not if, he could have chosen otherwise. What does Campbell mean here? What Campbell really means is that it's the power of our choice itself that could have changed how the course of events happened. Now, the, the little bit where he says not if, what is he getting at there? Well, look, if we just talk about a counterfactual, something other than what really happened, of course it could be the case that something else would have happened if somebody had chosen differently than they otherwise had. So look, for anything, I could have chosen not to make these videos to accompany the lecture. Of course, things would have been different if I had chosen different. The real question is, 
could I have chosen to do differently? Given how everything operates, given the whole causal history of the universe, given the sort of person I am, the sort of upbringing I've had, the environment I find myself in, the decisions that I'm faced with, is it within my power to choose to do things one way rather than another, assuming uh, that the choice has some kind of moral relevance? This is really all Campbell's interested in. He ultimately wants to argue that yes, we can sensibly believe that our choices have the sort of impact. We're really free to choose one way rather than another. We're not forced to choose one way rather than another. We're gonna see Ayer argue against the, this position. So just sticking with Campbell here for the moment uh, and, and what we've already taken a look at, he says, okay, let's really look at how we make moral decisions. When we're faced with some kind of moral dilemma, we really have a, a hard choice to make. How do we make those decisions? Can we trust our experience of how we make them? We looked at this last time, how do we actually make our decisions? Campbell says, well, oh, we actually do feel like we've got a choice in what we do. Uh, if we didn't really feel like we had a choice, we probably wouldn't feel guilty if we make a choice and later come to regret it. He says, we really are the sole authors of our moral decisions. That is, it's really up to us what we're ultimately going to do. But he says, and, and acknowledges, what kind of people we're like, our characters, broadly speaking, factor into the decisions we make, so too does our environment. So given the sort of character you have, the sorts of desires you have, the inclinations, the things you're likely to do, the kinds of habits you have, uh, how you've been brought up and trained, how you see the world, all these things matter. They influence the decisions we make. Our environment also influences the decisions we make. You only have to make certain decisions when you're put into a particular kind of situation. You know, I, uh, it's not, just not a frequent occurrence that I have to make really, really hard decisions about you know, life and death or, or anything like that. So even really sticky moral matters when we go, oh boy, well, I, I have to make this decision about what to do and that there are different factors at play and my utilitarian side pulls me this way and my Kantian side pulls me that way. And, oh, you know, assuming you can figure out what to do, but don't always actually feel like just doing what you think you should do. That's where we get put into situations where we have to make tough choices. Campbell thinks all these factors influence the sorts of choices we're actually confronted with and, and you know, the situations we're confronted with and the choices we have to make in them. But he thinks we really are free to make choices. We don't see ourselves as being pre-programmed in some sense and being forced to make one choice rather than another based on the causal history of the universe. So, so far so good. Campbell says, in practice, we act as if we've got uh, real choice. Can we trust that experience? This is really his next question. This is what he's getting at in section seven. He says, well, look, there are arguments for determinism. He's going to examine them. There's two that he brings up. We're gonna see them come up again in air, which we'll get to in this video after we take a look at Campbell. Cam Campbell's immediate response is this. He says, look, even if those arguments are cogent, even if they're, they're pretty good arguments, they suggest determinism might be true. And again, determinism is just the thesis that all of our actions are necessitated by previous events, that all the choices we make are themselves the effects of preceding causes. We can't choose any differently unless the universe itself were somehow different. That is, the sorts of causes acting as inputs into our choices have been different. So even if the arguments for determinism, for this view, are decent arguments, he says they don't force us to abandon our feeling of freedom and action. We don't have to automatically give up and admit the determinists are right, because it also seems like we've got some reason to believe that we are free, based on our own experience of how we make these decisions. So Campbell says the correct response when faced with these sorts of arguments from determinism is actually to admit that there's a deep puzzle. There's, there's an antinomy here at the heart of the self. What does that mean? It means we have good reason to believe two things that can't both be true. We have good reason to believe that we are determined, but we also have good reason to believe that we're not determined. So that puts us into a, a bit of a sticky situation, but Campbell says that's the right attitude to hold, that we've got this puzzle here. We're, we're just not quite sure what to believe. We should keep thinking about it. We're gonna see that Ayer doesn't really have that view. Ayer himself says, look, 
it could be the case in some sense that we have free will, but he says there's problems if we do, and we don't really have any good reason to believe we do, even though we, we might feel like we're free. Ayer says that's not really a sufficient reason to think you really are. So with this, Campbell turns to these two main arguments uh, that the determinist will put forward, the arguments from predictability and the argument from meaninglessness. Now, in uh, looking at these, really what Campbell is trying to do is show us that the arguments that the determinists put forward are not strong enough to force us to believe that we really are determined. So on his assessment, the arguments are weaker than they're often presented as actually being. They don't prove that we are in fact determined. And so really what we have here is reason on both sides. Reason to believe we're determined based on, on these arguments to some degree. Well, Campbell thinks, as we're gonna see, the, the, the weight of these arguments isn't that great really. They don't show what they're intended to show. And we also have that feeling of freedom in action. And that feeling itself, we all have, and he says that, you know, if you weigh these things out, that seems to be stronger than what these arguments can show. But let's just take a look at the arguments. So we already looked at this argument from predictability. The argument is pretty straightforward, it's pretty short. Really what determinists do is they say, look, we're just not random wild creatures. We're creatures of habit, we are predictable. All of that suggests that, as a matter of fact, we are really determined. We just don't have enough information to show that we're determined. We can't fully predict what people will do. And it seems like we would need to do that to show in practice that we're determined. But uh, based on what we observe, really the best explanation of our predictable behavior, largely predictable behavior, is that we really are determined after all. Campbell admits this is usually true. But most of the time, he says, sure, we are very predictable. Even in the fairly rare cases where we have a, a tough moral decision to make, Campbell says even there, we are uh, uh, generally predictable as well, in part because we can make predictions with uh, more and less degree of accuracy about what people are likely to do in a given situation based on how much moral effort they're gonna have to put forward to actually do what they think they should. Uh, what does that mean? Well, if you're torn between uh, either doing the thing you think you should or not, Campbell says, we have to think about how much effort's involved. If you put forward just a little bit of effort and that makes you do the thing you think you should, even though you don't really feel like it, he says you're far more likely to put forward a little bit of effort than if it takes a whole bunch of effort, right? If it only takes you a few seconds, or a little bit of energy to do the thing you think you should, you're far more likely to do it than if it takes hours or days to do it, or it takes a great amount of energy or say costs an awful lot of money to do the thing you think you should. So there's probabilities all the way through. We can make predictions about people uh, and how they're likely to behave. The more we know about them, the better the predictions will be. Arguably, as we get more and more information about how people behave and how our brains work and so on, we'll get even better at predicting how people behave. But predictions themselves are a kind of probability. I think it's likely this is gonna happen rather than that. Such probabilities just don't prove strict determinism. There's still room in there for freedom, right? We haven't shown that there's no logical space in the world for freedom, even if we can make all sorts of predictions about what people are likely to do. So that's really the argument for predictability and how Campbell responds to it. Now the argument for meaninglessness, this is in section 10, I think I've covered it up in the corner there, try to float my little uh, thing around a bit so I'm not covering up too much information. Um, well, and I put it in four spots, so I'll try to put it down here, I guess. So we looked at this argument before, this is very much an argument similar to what Mackey was talking about in the free will solution to the problem of evil, really what's going on is that if you've got uh, uh, someone, right, just take any person you want, could be you, could be somebody you know, could just be a fictional example. Say you get to know them, you know what their character is like, you know what sorts of desires they have, what they tend to do, what their habits are like, uh, just what they're like as a person, right? If, if somebody asked you to describe someone, you would describe their character, the sorts of things they're interested in, what they tend to do, 
whether they're generally good or bad, this sort of thing. The idea behind the argument for meaninglessness, and, and this is what the quotation up in the first bullet is really about, is that the argument goes basically like this. An act that is supposed to be a person's act, but isn't an expression of their character, is a meaningless or random act. Right? We can't really make sense of it. We can't connect it in the right way to who that person is. It seems more like a thing that just happens rather than a choice that that person made. This is really what the argument is. Ultimately, what the argument is trying to say is that the libertarian position, the position that we really have free will and we can make choices that themselves are caused by some preceding event, the upshot of the argument is that this view is just incoherent. It just doesn't make any sense. And this is really what Mackey was getting at when he's talking about the problem of evil. He says, look, if you say, um, even if God could have made all and only good people, people with good desires, they always want to do the right thing, they're caring, loving people, but for them to have free will, at least some of the time, they would have to choose to do evil things, even if they don't want to. Mackey says, then really what you're advocating for is a kind of random. That seems to be really what you want. That's what you're calling freedom or, or free will. It's the ability to be random and to make choices that don't reflect who you are as a person. Max says, that, that just doesn't make sense. I don't understand why God would want that rather than good people, if God is interested in promoting goodness above everything else. So then we can set aside the problem of evil because that's not what Campbell here is trying to actually deal with. But this is just... Uh, jog your memory from what Mackey was talking about to help make sense of this argument. So Campbell has some responses to this argument as well. He says, look, there are two things, two ways in which things can be intelligible or meaningful. One is by giving a causal explanation. That's really what Mackey seems to be largely interested in, as we're going to see Ayer is interested in this as well. Campbell says, but there's a second way we can make sense of things, that they can be meaningful or intelligible, and that's because we attach meaning to them. Right. So a free act, in the sense that it's an act that does not seem to come directly out of somebody's character, but instead is freely chosen, right, potentially against what they're usually likely to do, which, given the way Campbell wants to talk about a free act, really makes sense. You think you should do something, but you don't really feel like doing it. So your mind tells you this is the right thing to do, but your character inclines you to do this other thing because it's easier, you feel like it, or whatever. Right? Now, Campbell says, look, a free act like that, where we can't explain it in terms of your character or preceding causes or other sorts of motivations, we just can't give a causal explanation of why you would have done that thing. He says, now, of course, from the point of view of an external observer, somebody who's not you, they're not going to be able to make full sense of that act precisely because they can't explain it causally. And explaining things causally is really the way that we explain what other people do. Right? We only have access to our own minds and our own feelings. So we make some inferences about what other people think and feel and how they make choices and so on. But really, the way we understand events outside of ourselves is through causal reasoning. We understand that this thing causes that thing. If we really press the question, we don't really even know what that means. Um, the, it's another philosophical question, but what it is for one thing to cause another thing. One fairly minimalistic answer is that somehow there, there are relationships between things. One thing always follows another thing. When you get that, then you can say that you've got effect that follows from a cause. But then there are questions about repeatability and so on. So let's, let's, I'm just going to stop there. It's a very interesting question, what exactly a cause or an effect is and how they relate to each other. But this is primarily the way we understand the world around us, through causes. But it's not the only way to understand our own behavior and the decisions we make. This is really Campbell's point. Sure, maybe we can't understand exactly why somebody else did something or how they attach meaning to it, but we do this ourselves, maybe not all the time, but at least sometimes. We make a decision about what to do that's really not the usual kind of decision we would make. Sometimes we think that's even more important than the sorts of decisions we're likely to make. This is really the first step in his argument, uh, in the response. 
he gives to this argument. So he says there's these two ways of understanding how people make decisions. Now, he points out that libertarians, people like him who are trying to defend freedom of the will, are often criticized for denying that the only way something can be actually intelligible is to provide a causal explanation. Right? So there are these two ways. We can explain things causally, or uh, we can make them intelligible or meaningful by attaching meaning to them. Right? Now, what do the determinists do? Well, he says, often what they do is they say the only legitimate way to make something intelligible or meaningful is to explain it causally. Campbell responds, he says, look, that itself is a debatable point. Is the only way to make something meaningful or intelligible to give it a causal explanation? The determinists say yes, but a libertarian like him says no. So this is actually a point in the dispute. The determinist, if they actually want to show that attaching meaning to something is somehow illegitimate, they need to give an argument for it. And Campbell says he hasn't seen an argument forthcoming yet. So really when it comes to questions of burdens of proof, it's not up to the libertarian to, to have to show everything and show how, in fact, we have freedom of the will and things really aren't caused and so on. He says, we can do explanations that are not causal, or we can have things that are intelligible or, or somehow meaningful that aren't given some kind of causal elaboration or, or causal explanation to them. So there are these two different ways to explain it. And if somebody tries to criticize the libertarian position by uh, just saying only a causal explanation is a legitimate one, he says, until you've given an argument, really, you're really just begging the question. You're really arguing in a circle. Um, and of course, you can try to describe the libertarian position in, in sort of a, a demeaning tone, right? Oh, well, they think you can just make something meaningful by attaching meaning to it. Cale says, yeah, that. That's exactly what we believe. Describing it in a, a sort of condescending voice isn't an argument, right? If you, if you are a determinist and you disagree with this view, you have to provide an argument. Just talking about it sort of snooty tones itself isn't an argument. We could do that in everything, right? But it's not a set of reasons. So he says the determinist really has their work cut out for them here because they have to give an argument to show us why only causal explanations can provide meaningful explanations. Now, moving on a little bit uh, from this, Campbell elaborates a little bit more on the character and the nature of the self. This, these are his terms of how he tries to separate these two things out. So the character of the self is really that, uh, what, what I was talking about earlier, how we would describe somebody, what their habits are like, what they like, what they don't like, what their dispositions are, uh, the sorts of uh, properties or characteristics of a person that we could use to make predictions about how they're likely to behave in the future. Now, there's also the nature of the self. Now, the nature of the self is really like our point of view. It's, it's our consciousness, our seat of consciousness, where we actually make decisions, where we think about things. Right? Now, the nature of the self isn't just the same thing as the character of the self, Campbell says. He says, look, and, and you can think about this. You can think about your own character, how you would describe yourself to somebody else, but that's something different from your actual point of view, about how you make decisions, about uh, um, how you view the world. When we talk about the character of the self, in some ways what we're doing is, is describing or summing up uh, lots of decisions you might make, lots of experiences you've had over time, but just because they've happened in the past doesn't guarantee that they're going to happen in the future. Now, because these two things are separate, the nature of the self and the character itself, Campbell says it's important to draw the distinction here because this is precisely where we can start to distinguish between different parts of who we are and make some sense of how we actually make these free decisions. So the nature of ourself knows the character of ourself. Right? We know who we are, at least to some extent. Campbell seems pretty optimistic about how well we know ourselves. Some other philosophers, such as uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, who of course is a psychologist as well, would argue that we know ourselves an awful lot less than we think we do. But we can set that aside. Now, in Campbell's view, our, our, the nature of the self, our seat of consciousness, how we actually see the world, knows the character of ourselves. We know what we're like, and we actually have the power of changing our character. 
of making decisions that change the course of who we are. So of course we might be sort of on one path and we can make a decision, it might be tough to change how we're going in life, change what we're actually doing. And we know this from our own experience. So he puts it this way, he says, the nature of the self comprehends, but is not without remainder reducible to, its character. It must, if we are to be true to the testimony of our experience of it, be taken as including also the authentic creative power of refashioning, of fashioning and refashioning character. What does he mean here? Well, he just means something like this. We're talking about the character of the self, we're talking about our habits, what we're usually like and so on, but we aren't forced to continue into the future uh, behaving like we have in the past. Think about a potentially bad habit you have, right? Or perhaps just a, a good habit you hope to cultivate. Now, actually getting into a good habit or breaking a bad habit takes energy. Right? It, takes, it takes time, it takes energy, generally takes some kind of conscious choice to change what you're doing. Precisely because it's a habit, we can predict that you're likely to continue doing the thing going into the future. If you already have a habit that's good or bad, precisely because it's a habit, that means you do it regularly, so we can predict that you're likely to continue doing it regularly. But of course, habits change over time. If you want to cultivate a good habit right, or break a bad habit, you got to take some time and energy to really do that. So let's just say, for instance, I'll, I'll give a couple of different examples, right? Say you're, you smoke or you vape or something like that, and you think to yourself, you say, well, I know this really probably isn't very good for me. I should stop doing this, but I'm in a habit of, of doing it. I just sort of naturally reach for a cigarette or my vape pen or whatever it is, um, you know, in the morning or after I've had coffee or at lunch or whatever it is. Now, you can make a conscious choice to try to stop that, but it's gonna take some willpower. It's gonna take some time and energy, right? It's easier just to go along and do it. This is exactly what Campbell is talking about, about how do we make these sorts of moral decisions? Now, maybe this isn't quite a moral decision we're facing, perhaps not, but we could alter the example so that it is. Think also about something like study habits. Say you just wanna develop better study habits than you currently have. Well, if that's what you're trying to do, then of course you've got to put time and energy into actually developing this, right? Precisely if it was already, uh, if you're already doing it all the time, doing what you wanted all the time, you've already be in the habit that you want. So whenever you want to break a habit or develop a new one, this is exactly what Campbell is talking about. We can think about what we are like and what we would like to be like, and we can make a decision and put forth the effort required to change our habits and change ultimately our character. Right. Take maybe another habit. This one might be a little bit more explicitly moral. Say you get angry very easily, right? uh, so much so that you often get angry in a way where you lash out at people in, in a way that you think is inappropriate, it's unfair, it's not very nice. Let's just say for the sake of argument, you think that getting angry in the way you do is actually morally problematic. So you decide you want to take steps to be a less angry person. You want your character to be less angry. You want to develop habits of not being so angry. Now, that doesn't just happen. You don't flip a switch and suddenly your feelings change. Instead, you have to put forth effort. You have to go through a kind of process to refashion your character. This is really what Campbell is talking. So he thinks by making this distinction between the nature of the self and the character of the self that we can actually make sense of what it is for people to have the power of choice. The power of choosing really lies in the nature of the self, not our character. So thinking back to that argument from predictability, that's really based on the character of ourself, not the nature of the self. So in some sense, that argument is pointing to the wrong part of us, so to speak when it's trying to argue that we really aren't free to make choices after all. So that's all I've got to say here for Campbell, at least for the um, time being. So now we're gonna switch over to AIR. I'm just gonna pause this for a second to, to get myself set up, and then we'll flip over and start taking a look at AIR in a moment. Okay, so let's pick up with AIR now and see what he's going to argue in terms of this um, free will and moral responsibility debate. So 
Ayer's piece, Freedom and Necessity, uh, is a nice, succinct piece. It's, it's fairly short, and he gets right to the point. He's a, a nice, clear writer. Now, Ayer himself is a bit of an interesting character. He and Campbell are sort of rough contemporaries. They're both 20th century uh, philosophers. Uh, Campbell himself is, is Scottish. Ayer is English. Um, Ayer became famous pretty, pretty darn young. So he was only 24, and he was attending Oxford, uh, and he went into uh, Vienna. Uh, there was a very influential group of philosophers working in Vienna at the time. Uh, he knew some German, so he went there, um, talked with them, and then when he came back to England, he wrote this book, Language, Truth, and Logic. Uh, he, he was basically a, a student, you know, a sort of young graduate student, wrote this book um, that brought what was going on from what's widely called the Vienna Circle into the English-speaking world. Um, he, was, he was only 24 when he did this, and he's this very well-known public intellectual. Um, he lived during this time where you'd actually see intellectual debates on television, you'd have programs with philosophers and things like this. Maybe there still are such things, but uh, I'm, I'm a, I haven't watched cable television really for about 15 years, so I'm not, I'm not really sure what's out there anymore, but at least when I was watching it, uh, I certainly didn't find programming like I've seen A or B a part of. If you, you know, just go on YouTube or something, you can look up some pretty interesting philosophy resources. If you've gotten interested in, in philosophy and you just want to see a little bit more, there's some interesting old interviews and um, several interesting channels I've, I've even found online that just have interviews and different things like that. So um, anyway, so that's enough in terms of background for Ayer. What is he doing in this piece? Well, talked about Campbell, we talked about the different sorts of main positions there are in this free will determinism debate. There's really two questions. One, are we free or determined? Uh, can we actually make choices without being limited by the causal history of the universe? Or are the choices we make themselves the effects of preceding causes? Second issue, are we morally responsible for what we do in light of how we answer the first one? Now, Campbell's view is that we're only morally responsible if we're free. Right? That is, if we really have the power of choosing to do one thing rather than another, or put forth or withhold the moral effort, as he puts it, um, without that choice itself being the result of some preceding cause. And he says, so we're only morally responsible if we have that power, and in fact, we have reason to believe we have that power from our own experience of moral decision making. And the arguments from the determinists don't prove that we don't have it. Right? They might give us some reason to pause and think, but ultimately they don't show us that free will is incoherent, as the argument for meaninglessness would hold, or just proven wrong by the predictions we make about how people behave. We're going to see Ayer take a different approach. He's going to agree that we're morally responsible for what we do based on our decisions, but he is going to disagree with Campbell and say those decisions themselves are in fact the necessary effects of preceding costs. We're going to see how this argument unfolds here in the paper. So, Ayer uh, basically opens the piece with this. So this is the way he frames this problem, just like we saw Campbell framing the same problem. So there's actually a fair bit of over overlap between the Ayer and Campbell pieces, which is sort of nice because you can see as they go along, they sort of agree on the setup, they agree on certain things, they're both interested in the same two arguments, but they handle them differently. Ayer assesses those arguments and say they're very good ones. Campbell assesses those arguments, say, actually, no, they don't show us what we need to see. So let's take a look at what Ayer says here. When I'm said to have done something of my own free will, it is implied that it could have acted otherwise. And it is only when it is believed that I could have acted otherwise that I'm held to be morally responsible for what I have done. For a man is not thought to be morally responsible for an action that it was not in his power to avoid. But if human behavior is entirely governed by causal laws, it is not clear how any action that is done could have ever been avoided. So what do we have here? Just that line. Uh, for a man, of course, he's using this sort of gendered language, but you know, a person is not thought to be morally responsible for an action that it was not in their power to avoid. Think about an accident. If it's an honest to goodness accident, something occurs, we don't think it was reasonably foreseeable that it would occur. We don't think somebody is morally responsible for it. Right, if you, I don't, you know, say uh, um, you try to help me and due to a wild sort of random uh, uh, situation, you do something terrible to me but while you're trying to help me. And there's no way you could have reasonably foreseen what was gonna happen. I could have seen it, nobody else could have seen it. 
we wouldn't think you were morally responsible for the fault you caused. At least this is the, the claim. Right? But, and this is really the last sentence, if all of our behavior is governed by causal laws, all the decisions we make themselves are just the effects of preceding causes, then it's not clear how we could have ever avoided anything we ever did, because it really wouldn't be in our power to have made a different choice than we did. The choice itself was in some sense made for us, just in the sense that it was one effect in this giant causal sequence that is the universe as we know. And effects aren't free to happen or not when their causes occur. If you have the cause, you have to have the effect. There's no choice there, it just it occurs, it's guaranteed. So this is how air frames this problem. So really it's this question, do we have this free will that is, do the laws of causality that govern what's going on in the universe allow for some scope for human decisions to be free of preceding causes? What does it mean for them to be free? Now, Ayer admits, like Campbell, we often feel like we're free, right? When we actually are faced with some kind of decision, we stop, we pause, we think about it, we mull over our options, we make a choice, we may feel guilty afterwards. Ayer admits this, he says, Campbell's right, of course. Of course we feel like that. But if it is necessary that every event should have a cause, then the rule must apply to human behavior as much as to anything else. Sure, you feel free. Does it then follow that you are free? Right? Campbell says, well, it gives us at least reason to think we're free. Then he looks at reasons that the determinist might reject it. But Aaron wants to focus in a little bit more on this question of this feeling of freedom, right? Really, if the laws of causality say that every effect is a cause, every event, in fact, is an effect that has a cause, then there's just no scope for human freedom, not in the sense of making a decision that itself is not the effect of some preceding cause. So Ayer thinks, or at least suggests, he says, look, we could just reject the law of universal causation or the principle of universal causation. We could frame this differently. But the basic idea here is this. All events have some sort of cause. All events are an effect of preceding causes. When the cause occurs, the effect has to occur. Without the cause, you can't have the effect. And as a matter of fact, everything that happens in the universe was caused by something before it, which itself was caused by something before it, which was caused by something before it, which was, right. And this just goes back. Now, of course, there are these interesting questions we've already looked at. Um, has the universe existed forever? Is that just an infinite sequence? Was there a start to the universe? Say the Big Bang or the moment of creation by God? Interesting questions. But the universe as we see it, the more and more we look, at least seems to be the kind of place where if you look hard enough, every time you see some kind of event, you find some sort of cause that produced that event to happen. And we don't think, generally, this is what Ayer is banking on, that the universe is just a random place where things just happen, right? And I don't think you are likely to admit that sometimes things just happen either. So for instance, say you invite me over to your place and uh, I come over and you leave me in a, a you know, front room or something and there's a tray of cookies and you walk off to the other room, you walk back, all the cookies are gone, I'm covered in cookie crumbs. And I say, Carl, where'd the cookies go? I say, they disappeared, they're just gone. What's with the cookie crumbs? Those just appeared. Right? It just happened. No, no cause. You, you wouldn't believe me. Right? Um, for lots of other things too. If we see something happen and we then sort of look into it, if we don't find a cause, generally speaking, we're not likely to say, oh, there just was no cause. It was just completely random. It just happened. We might, depending on your inclinations, want to conclude that it was a miracle or something. But even if we say that, we're saying there was a cause. If there's something that occurred and it was really beneficial and we can't explain how it occurred, what we're actually doing is attributing some kind of cause to it, an act of God or some sort of divinity or something. Right? So we're still thinking in causal terms. We're still not thinking in terms of, oh yeah, stuff just happens. So here says, look, we could just reject this view. We could say, in fact, stuff just happens. The universe is just a random place. Right? Maybe all the time, maybe just some of the time. We could take up that position, but he says it seems really unwarranted. That seems extreme. 
given that the more and more we look and the more time and energy we put into finding causal patterns in the world, the more and more of them we find. That gives us some evidence to believe that really the best explanation of the way the universe works is that in fact, every event has a cause. We just don't know what they all are yet. It's just a limitation on human knowledge that's really holding us back from being able to show exactly why everything happens. If we had truly the mind of God, we would know ahead of time what people are gonna do before they do it. And there's just no freedom to speak of in the sense of being able to make a decision other than the one that you are going to be necessitated to make based on the causal history of the universe. So that's really in short Ayer's take on this. If you just look to the natural sciences, they continue to make progress. They never hit a stumbling block where they say, well, there, there's just no cause effect relations to be had here. They'll certainly say, we don't know what they are yet, but that doesn't uh, make people throw up their hands and say, well, I guess there just aren't any at all. Just like when we investigate, right? Say somebody is, is investigating a crime or something, can't figure out who did it. They don't say, well, I guess the crime committed itself, right? We say, no, it was an unsolved case. We're not sure what happened. We don't conclude it just happened mysteriously, randomly, in a way that nobody could ever explain in principle. All right, now, libertarianism itself. So Ayer thinks, you know, determinism has really the, it seems like the best case in light of the direction of the natural sciences. Right? But the way we're headed, if you just keep thinking into the future, it doesn't seem like in principle there's any reason why someday we can have enough information to explain why everything happens the way it does. But Ayer says, let's just pretend for the sake of argument, let's just grant the libertarian position works. Let's say determinism isn't so plausible up front. Let's say we had really good reason to believe in fact, not all events are determined. We really have this power of free choice the way Campbell wants us to have. If we grant that, what happens to the, the libertarian position? How coherent is it? Ayer says, not very. Uh, it turns out there is a problem embedded right in the libertarian position itself, right in the position Campbell wants to defend. And this again comes back to what it really means to be free. Ayer and Mackey are very much on the same page. If the libertarian's version of free will is an act with no cause, Ayer says, this seems just like randomness. Right? Campbell would call it meaninglessness. As Ayer puts it, it's just pure chance that we act one way rather than another. That's just what it is to have an act with no cause. It's just chance, it's just random. Right? There, there's nothing in principle I'm sorry about that. There's nothing in principle that explains why you did one thing rather than another. When you're faced with some tough decision, you're trying to decide if you should do the right thing or not. Let's say you do the right thing. Right? Well, why'd you do the right thing? One answer would be, well, you chose to do it. But why'd you choose to do it? No reason, literally, no cause. Right? There, in principle, we can't explain it. All we can say is that you chose it. So of course, if we're interested and we're saying, well, under what circumstances would you have chosen the other thing? The answer would have to be, well, the same circumstances. You could have chosen the other thing. You just didn't. And why didn't you? No reason at all. Now, Ayer admits that libertarians really only want this in a limited sense. And this is exactly what we saw in Campbell. Campbell says, look, I'm, I'm not trying to argue we're doing this all the time and that there's sort of this huge degree of randomness in the universe. All Campbell's trying to do is show that only in relatively rare situations where we've got some kind of moral decision to make that at least some of the time, we really are free to put forth or withhold the effort required to do what we think we do rather, uh, do what we think we should do rather than do what we just feel like doing. So it's really a very small percentage of acts where Campbell is trying to say we're really free in this relevant sense. So Ayer says, okay, okay, let's, Let's acknowledge that we don't want to straw man their position. Uh, that is, we don't want to misrepresent the position of the libertarian and then attack it for being a silly position. So let's just say we grant them that, right? So there's still a problem here. Let's just think about it. How do we actually make these choices? It's either it's an accident that I choose to act as I do or it is not. 
right? We can think accident, again, we could think pure chance, it's randomness, right? We, we could talk about it in those different sorts of ways. So either it's an accident we choose the way we do or not. Now, I'm just gonna quote Ayer here because he just, it puts it very well, it's, it's very clear, I can't do better, which is always a good time to just quote somebody else. So what are our choices? And this, Ayer is engaging in this argument conceptually now. He's saying, look, let's just sort of grant the libertarian what they want and try to think through the possibilities. And here, we've just got a binary. We have two options, right? Either it's an accident we choose the way we do or it's not an accident. So what follows from those two possibilities? Well, he explores them. If it is an accident, then it is merely a matter of chance that I did not choose otherwise. And if it's merely a matter of chance that we didn't choose otherwise than we did, we can't be held morally responsible for our choice because it's, it's an accident, right? And we already granted, thinking back, or at least you probably granted, that if somebody really doesn't have the ability to, uh, to have made the other decisions, really not in their power to have avoided something, then it's an accident. We're not morally responsible for accidents. So if it's not an accident that we choose to do one thing rather than another, Ayer says, then presumably there is some causal explanation of my choice. And in that case, we're led back to determinism. If in fact, it's not just an accident, it's not random or just chance that we do one thing rather than another, then presumably, you know, assuming every effect has a cause, every event has a cause, then there's some causal explanation. Some event made you choose one way rather than another. It could be a very complex event, something we can't explain, something that perhaps in principle, uh, you know, if we had enough information we could explain, but just as a matter of fact, we'll never be able to explain because we don't have enough information. But presumably there's some kind of causal explanation. That's, that's Thayer's thinking here. Now, this itself leads into this next possible response the libertarian can offer. Right? They say, look, uh, our character is important here. Of course, we heard from Campbell. Uh, there's an interesting question here whether or not Ayer is providing a full response to what Campbell said or not. And we'll leave that for you to think about. But it's an interesting question. We saw Campbell's distinction between the nature and the character of the self. Is Ayer doing enough to take that into account? Keep that in the back of your mind as we hear what Ayer has to say. So here, the libertarian can try to respond that when we're thinking about particular actions, in fact, it's not an accident. It's not just a matter of chance. We choose to do one thing rather than another. What the libertarian could say is that our character determines what we do uh, and, and the choice we make in a particular situation. But we're still free to develop our character in different ways. So ultimately, we're responsible for who we are. And it's who we are that ultimately explains what we do. So just trying to put that into, into some more concrete terms. Um, you know, if you're a good person, you choose to do good things. And maybe you just can't choose to do bad things. It's just not in your character. You're forced to choose good things. So you're not a good person. So you're a bad person. Well, in some sense, you're just not free to choose to do good things. You're, you're forced to do bad things, right? You just don't have the power to choose other ones. Maybe you're a so-so person like me. You're good in some ways and not so good in other sorts of ways. And when you're faced with a, a situation, a decision to make, really it's a matter of, of character that's making those decisions for you. Really, the response here for the libertarian is that you're responsible for being a good person or a bad person or a so-so person. Maybe you don't freely get to choose particular acts, but you do have some control over who you are. Sounds quite a bit like Campbell. So Ayer responds, if that's the way we're going to try to make sense of the libertarian position and defend it, he says, well, here again, right? This just pushes this issue back a step. If we are determined to develop our character in certain ways, right? That's a result of previous events uh, causally producing certain other events to occur. Then it's just not the case we could have a different character. Right? If the way our character develops is itself determined, then we're stuck with the character we have that authentic power of refashioning the character Campbell talked about. It's just an illusion. Right? It's just pushing this problem off, just sort of bumping it off down the line. Alternatively, if we're not de uh, determined to develop our character in certain ways, right, 
then we're back to pure chance. It seems like randomness. Why am I a so-so person, not a great person? Why am I not a saint? Why don't I spend my weekends and evenings, you know, volunteering at the soup kitchen or something like that? Why are you the sort of person you are? Well, on the, the second view here, if it's not determined, it seems like pure chance, it's just random. And if it's not that, then it seems like we are determined. Ayer thinks it's really a binary. We are or are, or are not determined to have the characters we do. We are or are not determined to make the particular decisions we do. Either way, it doesn't seem like it's really possible, it's really sensible to think that we're free in the sense to make decisions free of preceding causes, right? Not being restricted in that kind of way. Whether or not we try to attribute the particular decisions we make to our, our will in any given instance, or if we try to chalk it up to what our character is like on sort of an ongoing basis. So trying to invoke character as a way of explaining why we do what we do in certain circumstances, Ayer thinks that really isn't gonna help the issue at all. We're still faced with this issue. Either we're determined or we're not. If we are determined, then we couldn't have done anything different. We can't be a different person than we are. We couldn't make a different decision than we did. If we're not determined, then there is just no explanation. There's really no good reason why we did one thing rather than another. It's just an accident. It's just chance. Why you are who you are or why you do what you do. Right? And we're not morally responsible for those sorts of random chance accidents. So this is where Ayer turns the corner. He says, look, the libertarian wants free will because they want us to be morally responsible for what we do. But it just doesn't make sense for us to be morally responsible if we're free, because the kind of freedom they want, no matter how they try to carve it up, if it's anything other than determinism, then it's just a kind of randomness, chance, or accident. And we just are not responsible for random events, for chance occurrences, or for accidents. So can we save moral responsibility? This seems like something useful. Right? It's part of the way we think and the way we talk about people, how we evaluate actions and situations. Can we save it? Ayer thinks we can. How do we do that? By being a compatibilist or soft determinist. This was that position we talked about. We're talking about the four main positions on this issue. Uh, and of course, we've got libertarianism. That's Campbell's position. We've got hard determinism, which says we are determined, we have no free will, and we're not morally responsible for what we do. That position is very unappealing to many people. There's also the even more unappealing position that says everything's random and we're not morally responsible for what we do. Now, of course, it's unpopular, that doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just, it's, it's a very unpopular position. Ayer is trying to defend the other regular sort of popular position. We are determined, we're not free in that sense you might want, but we are still morally responsible for at least some of what we do. So let's see the details of what, uh, how Ayer proposes we're going to do that. Now, he, the, the real thrust of the proposal is just to change what we mean when we talk about being free. So the way Campbell was talking about it, the way the libertarian wants to talk about it, is that we're free when we're not determined to act in certain ways. Ayer says, what we ought to do is think about freedom in terms of constraint, right? Instead of contrasting freedom with caused, right? You're free if you're not caused to do the thing. You could freely choose it if you're not necessitated. Instead, we think about it in terms of you're free if you aren't constrained in your choice, right? You're free in the sense appropriate for moral responsibility if your choice or your action isn't constrained. Now, your action is still going to be determined, right? You're not free to just do whatever you want. As a matter of fact, what you choose to do itself will be the necessary effect of preceding causes. But there are relevant constraints that we take into account when we assess the, the moral worth of somebody's action. Think about situations where somebody is hypnotized, right? forced at gunpoint, physically restrained, or psychologically coerced. Let's just talk about forced at gunpoint or physically restrained. Right? Say I you know, 
um, lock you in your house or, or chain you to the desk or something, can you be held morally responsible for not leaving? No, you can't, right? Because it just wasn't in your power to do so. Say I, um, you know, what? Tie you to the, the back of a wagon or something, right? Or, or sort of handcuff you to a bumper of a car and then slowly drive, not, not too fast, don't drag you, but I, I drive along and you're sort of forced to walk with the, the car or the wagon. Are you morally responsible for going that way? I'd say I'm leaving you away from your family or something. No, no, right? You didn't really have a choice. Same with being forced at gunpoint. If somebody has a gun to your head and tells you to do something, odds are you're probably going to do it. And in most situations, we understand, right? We might think you're doing something wrong if you steal a loaf of bread. Somebody holds a gun to your head and says, steal a loaf of bread or I'm gonna shoot you. Most of us don't think there's a moral issue with stealing a loaf of bread. Right? Maybe if we get to certain extreme scenarios, we'll think there's a problem. But we think having a gun to your head or being physically constrained, those are certain mitigating circumstances that really take away your power of making the choice that you would make if you weren't constrained in these ways. The law takes all of this into account. When we think about whether or not somebody is responsible and to what degree they're responsible for what they did, the law takes into account these sorts of mitigating circumstances. Think about somebody who has a, a, some sort of medical condition. Say they have an unexpected seizure or something, and as a result of the seizure, they hit someone. We don't think they're morally responsible for hitting someone. Right? Maybe in certain circumstances where they know that they're at high risk for a seizure and ought not to be doing certain things, maybe, hey. But if we don't see it coming, we don't have good reason to believe that it's going to happen, then generally speaking, we don't hold the person morally responsible for what they did. Right? Well, why not? Ayer says, it's not because we think all of a sudden somebody's actions aren't cause. Rather, it's that we think the causal sequence doesn't trace back to that person in the right sort of way. Our actions are always caused by our character, by our environment, our upbringing, the situations we face, the different sorts of factors and influences that there are on the sorts of choices we make. We hold people morally responsible for what they do when they are, in some sense, free to choose what to do. What does that mean? It means they're not constrained. What sorts of choices do you make when somebody isn't watching you? What sorts of choices do you make when somebody isn't physically restraining you, holding a gun to your head? What happens when we give you a certain degree of freedom? How will you use it? If you use it poorly, you make decisions we don't like in some broad sense. Generally speaking, those are the sorts of decisions we say are morally bad ones. We blame you for it. If you make decisions that we overall like, right, you help other people and so on, those, generally speaking, are the sorts of decisions we think are morally right ones. Right? We'll praise you for it, reward you for it to some degree. So it's really a question of what is really making the choice. Now, Ayer says our behavior is always caused, it's always necessitated, it's always the result of certain preceding events. Right? If it weren't, we couldn't be morally responsible for it because it would just be random. So assuming that our behavior is in fact determined, right? the choices we make is determined by our character and the situations we find ourselves in, our character itself is the result of preceding causes, our whole long history of training, education, genetics, upbringing, environment, right? everything, everything you've ever done, everything you've ever experienced, everything that's ever influenced you goes into who you are. We might not be able to see it or measure it, but it's all there, right? Maybe just sort of tucked away in the neurons or something like that. We talked a little bit more about what minds might be uh, in the, the next series. But that's all there. It's all part of who you are. And really, who you are is, in Ayer's view, and he doesn't quite come out and say this, but I think we can read it between the lines, where Campbell distinguishes between the character of the self and the, the nature of the self, Ayer just has no such distinction, right? For him, we just are our characters, right? You just, you are who you are in some sense, right? You are what you decide, you are what you do. Now, of course, when you're constrained, when you have these mitigating circumstances, we think differently. We realize that you're not free in the right kind of sense, you're being influenced. Right? 
But if there aren't those sorts of factors involved, what kinds of decisions do you make? Right? They're going to be caused, but you're still responsible for them because you're the one that made the decision, even though who you are is itself the effect of certain preceding causes. Now, Ayer breaks it down. He gives us three conditions. They're each necessary, so each condition has to be met, and they're jointly sufficient, so all three together are enough for us to be morally responsible for what we do. So what are those three conditions? First, I should have acted otherwise if I had so chosen. So you're talking about himself here. So we can only be morally responsible for an action if our making a different decision would have actually produced a, a different action. So again, think about somebody who has an unexpected uh, you know, medical condition, a seizure or something. Right? Now, they can't really choose to act otherwise than they do. They just lose control of their body. So really, the element of choice is gone there. Right? Um, say there's an, an honest, honestly unforeseen uh, accident of some sort. Right? The, the brakes on the vehicle you're driving suddenly fail. And then when you try to activate them, they won't they won't go right um, you might have tried to make a different decision there but if you tried to break sooner or something well look there's still no brakes right so it's this question would a different choice have actually had an effect on the action you undertook secondly the action was voluntary in the sense in which the actions say of a kleptomaniac or not this is that point he was talking about of being psychologically forced. Now, I didn't talk about that much previously, but really what he's doing here is acknowledging that there can be certain psychological conditions that really prohibit us from acting in certain sorts of ways. Some people just have a, a mental constitution such that they just can't help but make certain decisions. For instance, the kleptomaniac is someone who just steals uncontrollably. That's not even because they really want the stuff. It's not that they're getting a kick out of it or it's, it's really great. They just feel utterly compelled to steal. Think about somebody with some form of obsessive compulsive disorder. Something like this. Ayer acknowledges that those conditions are real. They really exist. And they can restrict the sorts of choices open to some people. Third, nobody compelled me to choose as I did. So what's this? Again, think about being physically restrained or having a gun to your head somebody in some sense forcing you to do something. Now that is a little bit different from the first two conditions. The first condition is really about whether or not your own um, choice would have changed your action. The second one is whether or not you're psychologically compelled somehow. The third one is whether or not there's some other uh, person forcing you to do one thing rather than another. If all of these three conditions are met, right? That is, we're not compelled by somebody else. We don't have some kind of psychological compulsion restricting our behavior, and our, a different choice on our part would have resulted in a different action on our part, then Ayer says we can be held morally responsible for what we do. But in all cases, what we wind up actually choosing to do itself will be a necessary effect of preceding causes. By viewing our actions this way and adopting this sort of stance, Ayer says we can preserve moral responsibility in cases where it's appropriate, while not getting ourselves tied up in knots over trying to avoid determinants. Now, of course, Ayer acknowledges that many people fight against determinism, and they, they want to say that we really have free will because they, they have a certain sort of feeling that somehow if we're determined, we are special or interesting, our lives might lose meaning, something like this. A responds to that and argues that these are really metaphorical implications of determinism. Right? There's nothing that forces us to actually believe, uh, believe any of that. So he really concludes this piece. He says, there, there's this way of thinking about causes and effects where the effect is somehow just part of the cause or under the power of the cause or somehow not special or interesting or worthwhile. Ayer says, but that's that's just a kind of metaphor, right? There is no reason to actually think that. Think just for instance, look, we are all the products of, of parents, right? We're all the products of human reproductive activity. Probably didn't think I was gonna say that in this video. Now, 
the mere fact that we were produced by other humans, we're in some sense the effect of certain preceding causes, right? What they did and, and what happened and us sort of staying alive and so on. Now, does that somehow make us any less special or interesting or worthwhile? Does that deprive our lives of meaning? He says, no, of course not. And none of us really think that, right? None of us think unless we sort of appeared out of nothing and there was no cause to why we exist in the first place. Would we really be special or interesting or our lives would be worthwhile or our choices would be endowed with importance or something like that? He says, so really what we have here is a, a, a kind of false metaphor. And what does it do? It says, what are the effects of that? Well, it gets in the way of us making our moral and metaphysical thinking compatible. When it comes to thinking about how the universe works, determinism is just the best view. It's just the most plausible. It says we can't even really make good sense of the libertarian position. Right? If you've got free will, that just means what you did or who you are is somehow random. We don't think you're responsible for things that are random. So he says there's this, this perpetual conflict as long as we give uptake to that metaphor. He says, so how do we get out of it? Just don't do it. That's it. Just reject it. Right? Look. Um, are, are we any less special or interesting or worthwhile or lives any less meaningful because the decisions we make are the necessary effects of preceding causes? He says, no, it's just kind of feeling. Right? Maybe, and, and this is where something interesting comes in, maybe you're just the sort of person where you're necessitated to feel this way, right? That if in fact your actions are determined that somehow they're less worthwhile or interesting or meaningful. Maybe you just can't help it. In fact, if air is right, in some sense you can't. Now, of course, that seems like, uh, you know, if somebody has an uncontrollable feeling that is not a good feeling, generally speaking, we think that's, that's grounds for, in some sense, feeling sorry for somebody or, or sort of pitying them. Right? I think this is really the kind of attitude air would take up. But if you can reject that feeling, if you can come to just accept determinism, to recognize the fact that our, our best theory suggests that, in fact, everything we do and who we are is just the necessary effect of preceding causes, well, we can live on. We can preserve moral responsibility. We can still find things meaningful and interesting, and worthwhile and valuable. And in fact, we can make our thinking more coherent by adopting this point of view. Right? So if we can, A really thinks we should. Right? And if we can't, well, maybe it's something to try to work on. Right? You know, maybe over time, we can change our characters. You know, maybe Campbell's right there, but maybe it's not in the way he thinks. Ayer would think about, you know, in, in terms of how do we change our characters, because Campbell seems right. We can change our habits. We become different people over time. So how does the determinist explain that? Whether or not you become a different person over time and in different situations, whether or not you put forth the effort to change who you are. All of these things, Ayer would say, themselves are determined. So you can take two different people, they both have, say, a bad habit, say they're, you know, whatever it is, they both want to change, they both try to put forward some effort to change, one changes, one doesn't. What does that mean? Ayer says, oh, it just means, uh, if we had more information, we've discovered that the one person put forward enough effort to change their own character. The other one didn't. Why? That itself was just the result of preceding causes, what their character is, what their environment's like, how strong the stimulus was and so on, how much uh, effort it would take to change who they really were. It's, it's just all determined, all the way down. But that doesn't mean we cease being who we are. So that takes us to the end of air. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope it helped make sense of both the Campbell reading and the air reading. I'm currently looking into developing an alternative way of conducting an exercise online. I'll be sharing some more information about that uh, shortly. In fact, by the time I share this video, I might already have that information circulated. I'm not going to put it here just because I'm still working on it. Um, and I'm, I'm still looking into exactly what we can do in terms of covering the remaining content in our, our course schedule. Uh, I'm looking at potentially trying to condense some of it uh, or potentially even just cutting off. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm thinking the last week's worth of content, so uh, just the last two readings. I'm still looking into that, so stay tuned so, for some further information once I have it. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Please feel free to get in touch if there's anything in this video that you think could be better in terms of the way it's, it's conducted or the way I've set it up. Uh, if you've got any questions about the readings, please don't hesitate to contact me. I hope you're all, as well as possible, given the new and unfolding circumstances we find ourselves in, and I'll be back in touch fairly soon. Bye for now.